Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, last session before the finishing keynote. I'm happy to see so many people here. I hope you have the energy left. I do know that I myself popped up with some sugar before this session, so I, I hope I can keep the energy going. I want to tell you about what happens when DevOps meets reality. And uh, I want to be clear, like, this is opinionated. This is my opinion. I do know there's other truths out there about what it really means, but I want to give you some context. Uh, so who am I to tell you about this? And I am the product area lead for engineering enablement at Cognic, which is a startup. I'm also CNCF ambassador, active in the cloud native Nordics meetup community, which consists of like Iceland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland, and also a meetup organizer in Gothenburg, where I'm from. The reason why I'm here telling you about this is because I've been working in a platform team for the last five years and in different uh, kind of DevOps organizations for the last eight years, if not more. So I have a story of what I think is true here, and I hope I can share that with you. So DevOps, let's talk about DevOps. That's why we're here, right? So who here work in an organization with DevOps? OK, that's quite a lot. Great. Uh, who here would say that their organization has development teams working in a DevOps manner? That's significantly less. Who here thinks that everyone in this room shares the same picture of what DevOps means? Yeah, that's not, that was kind of what I was hoping for because that makes sense then that I tell you about what I think DevOps means. So I think about DevOps as a way of empowering autonomous teams. This is what, for me, means DevOps. And I think that the empowered autonomous teams, their goal is to ship some kind of product. You, it might be a mobile application, it might be a REST API, whatever your application is, the goal is to ship that. And I believe that an empowered autonomous team has the tools and the workings to take that from beginning to end and further on. And I think if you have teams that can work in that manner and are unblocked by others in order to deliver on that, then that team is working in a DevOps manner. That's my definition of it. So none of the DevOps engineer, no insult to anyone uh, identifying as one, but that's not what I mean with DevOps. I mentioned applications, and I think that it might be useful to look at an application lifecycle. And first of all, I do know once again that it depends. What kind of software are you shipping? What is your application? What does a product mean to you? Uh, so I thought that in order for all of us to share this common picture of what it means, let's start with this application. This is an example. As you can see, I'm not a UX designer, but I like coffee. And I don't know if you tried the coffee bar outside, but they have delicious coffee. So let's say that our goal is to ship a product that is an easy to way to order coffee in like a, sh a coffee chain or whatever. We don't have anything, but we thought whether we should start with a minimum viable product, so let's look at uh, buying one espresso. That's the first step. So uh, we try to get, create something. And in order to do this, we often start with something such as customer discovery. We need to figure out what problems do we need to solve, what are our users need, um, what would make them happy, and what kind of constraints do we have on this solution? So in the instance of ordering coffee, maybe bef uh, people haven't drunk coffee before ordering, so the solution needs to be simple enough for people who are pre-coffee ordering coffee. I know at least I can't handle a lot of complicated things before my first coffee in the morning. So the next step comes, we figure out what problem we're going to solve, we figure out some constraints, and now we want to build it. And this is typically the building the code, writing the code, here you might have different kind of solutions. In our case, maybe we go with a web application, maybe we need some kind of backend in order to gather the, uh, the orders and store them and, and those things. And after you've written the code, you go on to building and packaging. So you probably have some CI pipeline for this one. You probably run some unit test because you want to test your code. That's good, we learned, right? Uh, you might have some automatic integration testing. Maybe you have several uh, backend services that are supposed to work together. So you want to have those tests run. And then if you're running in a container runtime situation, maybe you want to build and package a container. If you're not running container runtime, maybe you need to package some kind of uh, binary, whatever that 
might be. I'm very cloud, I'm very container pro, so that's what I'm going to use for my examples. So uh, after that, maybe you are going to do some testing. As I mentioned, units test before, that's one part of testing. But then we also have like, maybe you have a QA environment, maybe you know that you want to do some uh, deep testing on your application before you roll it out. Uh, some people are testing production, that's fine, but you probably still do some sort of testing at one point. And once you have done the testing, you want to make it available for the users. Deploying to production is usually a common term. So if we look at from an end user perspective, this is the first time that they have any value coming out. This is the first time that they actually gain something from whatever you have done. You spend a lot of time, but this is the first time they actually gain something. And a lot of people would think that this is where the development team responsibility ends, because they shipped it, right? It's out there. But isn't it weird that you would think that your work is done when actually it is starting to contribute value? So after, develop, uh, deployment, sorry, after deployment, we do have the step of maintaining and monitoring because you want to make sure that this application continues to be available to user. And you might want to know that it's working in a way that you expect it to work. And then at the end, you do the evaluation. Did we solve the problem that we set up to solve? Uh, is this actually providing the value to the users that we expect? Uh, can they order the coffee? What is the next step that we can improve? We're going back to customer discovery and we start all over. You probably recognize the infinitely, uh, infinity loop of DevOps. This is my version of it. It's basically the same, but it looked nicer when I did my boxes. So we have this flow. We do know that we will repeat it as we add new functionality. Maybe we're going to add, like I don't know, Fika to the ordering system because everyone likes a good cinema bun and all these things. If we look at the full life cycle of the application. This is all the steps that it goes through. Where do our development teams fit in? Which step do the classical development team involve in? If you're looking in a non-DevOps organization, it might look that, I mean, for sure, the code, that's developers, right? M maybe testing, but we all know developers don't like testing. Building packaging, maybe. Deployment. Maybe, it depends on what kind of organization you are in, but probably not. And customer discovery, maintaining monitoring, and evaluating, those things that are things that probably ends up on the operations team and on like the PM team, the product management team, whatever it might be. But our bet is that if we can empower the development teams to be part of all steps of this application, then the resulting application will be better. Because if they can also get the feedback from the users, did this solve the problem or not? Did this turn good? Is, is it breaking in production all the time? Whatever is happening, we can deliver better software. So we want to be, make them be part of everything. And that's what we want with DevOps. So if we can make that happen, then maybe we don't end up with this application. Maybe we actually get something that is good. I made it so I can make fun of it. Um, and yay, that's a super fun, great, like awesome. Let me get the best coffee ordering application out there. How can I get started? This is awesome. But is it really that simple? Because if I go to my Java backend developer and say that, oh, you're going to do customer discovery, by the way, <laughs> how do you think they react? Do you think they will be happy? They will be like, yay, let's go. No, probably not. There are some challenges, actually. and. It, I want to cover some of them and, and share some ideas around it. So the first one is when they mentioned like everyone going to be a superhero, everyone going to have to all do all the things. This is a very common phrase that I hear when we talk about DevOps and transitioning from a more split up organization into a DevOps organization. Like, do you have to be an expert in all the things? And really, no, you don't. Like, the idea is to have a team that has all the competence you need in order to work in a DevOps way, not that each individual inside that team has that knowledge. There's a difference. You want to build a cross-functional team where everyone can contribute to this. And then maybe as a backend developer, it's good if you understand the customer needs. Maybe it's good if you can do and understand these things, but maybe you don't have to know exactly how to conduct customer discovery. Maybe it's just enough to understand the results from it. 
and someone else on your team can be the expert in that. Another risk is, or a challenge I would say, is to have silos. If each team is responsible for all the parts of the application lifecycle, there's a risk that they are each finding their own way of building applications. It's great because they are powered and they are autonomous and they can make these decisions themselves, but there's also the risk of like reinventing the wheel all over again. Some team is solving something and then the next team comes along and they can't learn from that because you have the silos of each team owning everything themselves. And unless you enforce some kind of knowledge sharing or something, there's a huge risk that there's no overlap. And also when you get to that point from an organization perspective, it becomes very hard because most organizations do reorgs from time to time. I'm not sure who in this room has been through a reorg in the last six months. I know I did. <laughs> yeah, not that many. In the last year? No? Yeah? Okay. You have very stable organizations. I think I've been through three in the last one year. So, it, I mean, it changes a lot. And whenever you change, uh, you might want to move and organize so this application no longer is owned by Team X. Now Team Y owns it. But Team X chose how to build it. And Team Y doesn't know how to maintain and continue developing it. Let's say one team decides to develop in a different language that no one else outside that team knows about. And then maybe you have a very large team and you want to split into smaller teams and suddenly you don't have the knowledge that you need in order to maintain it because every team is doing their own thing. Or even worse, maybe you want to, uh, like one team, someone is quitting and you don't no longer have that knowledge around or whatever. So it's hard to move on the ship and it's hard to reform the teams. And this is also one of the struggles that comes from when every team has their own unique solution. Another problem is that, I mean, we only want coffee. <laughs> Back to the application, right? We want good coffee, we want an easy way of ordering it, and now suddenly we are spending a lot of time on, on a lot of other things. So we want to have our teams to be empowered and to be part of all steps of the application lifecycle because we think everything will be better, but suddenly everyone has to care about all the things. You have to care about how to solve logging, you have to care about how to deploy your application, you have to care about how to figure out if it's broken, you have to care about all the things that are part of application development that maybe you didn't have to care about before. So regardless of these challenges, I still think that it's worth a shot. I, think, I still think that we can build better things if we do this. So what can we do in order to do that? And I mean, if you read the notes, maybe you know, like platform teams, yay. I care about platform teams. I think it's a great thing. And I think one of the things that platform teams can do is they can help building an abstraction layer on all those things that are common needs for the teams, which means that the teams will still maintain their autonomy, but they will be able to benefit from someone else's works and make it their own. And they will get a lot of things for free. So at a, as a platform team, we create uh, like, um, it's an abstraction that solves like the common needs and allow developers to focus. And when I say developers here, I really mean like maybe a product team. I don't know what's a good term for a team that works in a DevOps manner because I can't say a DevOps team because that means something else. I can't say a developer team because then it sounds like it's only developers, but let's call it a product team. It allows a product team to focus on what is important while still making use of all these things and still having like the ownership and the, the um, Ah, uh, I forgot the word. Accountability, yes, accountability uh, for these things. And when you create the paved road as a platform team, you make it easy to do certain things. So as a platform team, you can create a paved road for uh, this is the way that you uh, deploy your applications. This is the way that you run your workloads. This is the way that you uh, ca gather your logs. This is the way that you uh, send out metrics. Maybe it can even be like, here's a library that we use for authentication, and everyone can use the same, so not everyone has to figure out how to solve authentication in our application. But with autonomous teams, there's also always the choice. We don't enforce the teams to use the things that the platform team provide. It's an option. And the platform team has to focus on making it easy enough and valuable enough to use their solution that the, teams will f uh, that the product teams will want to do that. And if the product team chooses to do something else, 
they are accountable for making that work. They are accountable to make a good decision because they will take on a cost that they will have to maintain over time. If some team decides that, oh, I'm not going to run on Kubernetes, I'm going to do cloud functions instead. And then they have to maintain how to do cloud functions unless that is part of the paid road that the platform team provides. As a platform team, you also can't solve all the use cases. You have to be slightly opinionated because platform teams are often smaller or like less people than the rest of the uh, product teams, which means that you can't do like custom integration for all the things that everyone wants. So you have to figure out what do we think is the golden path of solving this problem? What is the right way of doing these things? You can be opinionated because as long as you're not locking someone into your solution, they are free to choose something else. As a platform team, I recommend that you uh, aim for the 80% use case. You try to solve the problem for 80% of the users. I mean, this is just, what do we think about this? But you, if you solve the, pro uh, uh, the problems for the vast majority of the developers, then you will uh, save a lot of time, or whatever you want to call it, for the product teams. And I think by doing the 80%, you also have a way of uh, allowing people to, um, what do you call, try out and experiment with other things. And each team, as I said, they can choose for themselves. Is the thing that I want to do such a unique use case that it's worth to go my own way, or should I just stay on the paved road? I think it's very important when you do platform that you treat it as a product. Platform engineering or platform teams provide a product to the other product teams in your company. They are your users. You have to treat them as your users. The good thing, though, is that they can't hide because they're within your company, so you can always go out and ask them what you think about our service. And they, if they are nice people, they can't say no, which is not always the case when you have a real product, right? That's one up. And I would also say that you need to do, I mean, all the steps that were part of the application lifecycle add that into your platform, treat it as such, do small iterations, figure out what to do, you have to maintain, you have to monitor. Uh, it's also, if other teams are depending on your platform, maybe your production environment needs to be stable enough because when your production fails, then the company production environment fails. So it's quite a lot of a responsibility. So also be sure that you don't want to deploy something for your users unless you're willing to maintain it and make it sure that it's continue to be uh, available. It's also important to figure out to have like cross-functional teams as a platform. You need to be able to solve the needs you need. Um, depending on what your platform means, maybe you don't need front-end developers, or maybe you do. It depends on what you're building. As an example, uh, think about this situation. Uh, we have the application layer at the top. We do have the different small towers my representation of teams, and then we have the platform team underneath. And each the product team is like different setup, they have different skills, different people, etc. that's why they're different, but they all need some common things. And as a platform team, you can provide that. So for instance, it could be CICD. And that's because most, most people building something need some kind of CI to build and package and some CD for deploying. And uh, as a platform team, you can provide that and make it easy for the teams to, to use. And you can also provide like a common runtime environment, for instance, Kubernetes, as I mentioned, is something that I care about a lot. Kubernetes in itself, it doesn't make sense to ask a development team or a pro product team to maintain their own Kubernetes cluster because it's a lot of work and there's a lot of people who spend like full-time work just understanding what Kubernetes means and staying up to date with all the functionality and all the things. So to ask each development team to spend that time doesn't make sense. And Kubernetes in this case is just one example. This is probably applicable to a lot of other technologies and tools as well. So as a platform team, you can make that available. You can adapt Kubernetes to fit your use case and make sure that the other developers, the other product teams can get maximum value out of it without too much overhead, which it would be otherwise. And then like metrics and logging could also be a thing. For instance, we do uh, automatically harvest all the logs from all running containers 
and we forward them into a centralized logging solution using Elasticsearch and Logstash. The good thing about that is that none of the developers have to care about how their logs go from the running container into Kibana, but the bad thing it would be if it stopped working and we didn't care about it. So as a platform team, we have to continue maintaining that and making sure that it keeps working so that the, when the product teams need to debug the application, they can find the logs where they expect them inside Kibana. Same goes for metrics, works in a similar way. You can either like get all the metrics or you can uh, have like exposed ports where you can harvest the metrics as well. So a few examples of what empowering DevOps teams can look like. I want to leave you with some concrete examples of what it can mean, because I know a lot of things that I talk about is very fluffy. I say it could be Kubernetes, it could be something else, etc. So I want to give you some real world examples, some of them from my own environments, others from what I've seen others do. Um, the first one is uh, zero investment dashboards. If you have a standardized way of running applications in, let's say, a container in Kubernetes, you can very easily get a dashboard over CPU and memory usage for, that in, for those instances and making that available to your development and product teams. And just CPU and memory is just a use case. We also do have like a similar thing over uh, HTTP traffic, so we can get error code, and we can like uh, response code, we can have request rates and all these things. And this is uh, an example from Grafana's uh, official site over like dashboards collections, but you can pull something ready from there and you can adapt it to your environment and you can make it do whatever you want it to do. And then we can have, as you can see, there is a drop down in the top that says deployment. And, and node, and there the user can just select their own application, and then they can see specific metrics for their application. And when we have this kind of setup, and we know that all applications use the same, then it doesn't matter if an application moves between teams, or if you are perhaps like helping someone debug, because you do know how to find the metrics for your application, and you know that the other application probably works the same, and you can find it in a similar way. This makes it very easy when you do want to do shared and cold rotations or similar, but that's a longer story, most likely. Another thing to look at could be template applications. As I said, as a platform team, you can be opinionated. Being opinionated might be that you have an idea of what is a good way of building an application. And let's, for instance, just assume that it might be some kind of uh, REST API thing. So you can set up a template for this is what I call a baseline uh, REST API application. And then teams can very really easily reuse that as a base, and they can get to a state where they have it up and running. Maybe they get even as far as having it easily deployed to production with some health endpoint, maybe like some other starting endpoint up, and it can integrate all the best practices and guidelines for how to build applications at your uh, company and with your organization. This is super useful when you get to a state where it makes sense. If you're a very small company and don't create new applications that often, maybe it doesn't. But it, it's good to know that these are some other things you can do with a platform team if you invest time and energy into it. Real world example, Backstage.io. Backstage is a developer, uh, internal developer platform platform, kind of. Uh, it, it's an open platform for building developer portals. That's what it says in my notes. That's probably a better way to phrase it. So it originated at Spotify, but then what, uh, was uh, given to CNCF as an open source project. And it's now under the CNCF um, umbrella. Uh, CNCF is the umbrella that holds communities and a lot of the supporting projects. It is meant to be a place to gather all the things that your developers need to care about. So in this instance, the example that I want to show you, uh, and the link goes to a blog post explaining this feature with a video as well, so I can recommend checking that out if you're interested. But basically, it is a good way of figuring out how to create a new application based on a template. So in this case, they have a page where you can go, where you can select like, okay, so, I want to create like a base React application. It might be 
uh, I don't remember what I have, like a Golang microservice, whatever it might be. And these are the provided best practices guidelines on how to create an application at, in this example. And when you cl click on the, one of those that you want to create a new one, you get through a, uh, um, what's it called, like a wizard, where you are able to fill out your things. And then in the end, I think it goes as far as like creating uh, the source code and like a template for deployment and all these things that you might need to get started. And basically it's just one click deploy. Or it might even take as far as it's up and running in staging or in production, but it's just answering to a health endpoint or whatever makes sense for you. Uh, I think this is really cool and it's something that I would really like to do. Uh, at our company right now, we do have something similar, but it's less fancy but you can get to a point where you can get a lot of things generated for you, and then you can adapt from there and build, uh, build further on top of that. Another possibility is uh, GitOps powered by Argo CD. And I actually took this screenshot this morning from our own environment because we do have an uh, example application up and running, which makes it very easy. Uh, GitOps is a way of pushing configuration code to Git and then have some kind of tool, in this case Argo CD, reconsolidate uh, actually running state with whatever is in the configuration. And using this, we can provide this as a common ground. There's a nice UI that users can go to. They can see all the information about their deployment. In this case, it has like, I don't know, it, it's a lot of things I, not meant to be read, but showing you that there is something. And this is the state of the art way of deploying applications at our company. And we have that as an opinionated way. It doesn't mean that someone can't do something else. It's just the easy way to do things. And I, I think actually everyone is following this way because it's so easy to use and it gives you so much power. So these were some concrete examples. And I think that I want to show you some of the things that are out there. I, I was actually like, I know there are so many more things. I, I wish I could show you all, but I didn't have time to gather approval from people sharing their things. But I would recommend looking into the space because people are doing really cool things around this subject. And I think that while there's a lot of things you can do, I hope you have an idea of what it could mean. So looking back, I think what we looked, what we learned today is like, Modern DevOps teams are cross-functional and autonomous. And if you have that, they can work towards it. But there are some challenges with it that you need to address. Otherwise, you might end up in a situation where it costs you a lot. And platform team can solve common problems. And the way to do that is to aim for the paved roads for the 80% of use case. Don't try to solve it all. Try to make it, spend effort where you can make the difference. But most importantly, what I really want you to leave with here is that platform teams can empower developers to reach their goals. And they can really make a difference for them when it comes to surviving a DevOps environment. And that's all I had for today. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I will hang around here for questions or just outside, but otherwise, thank you and uh, see you around.